Hello, and welcome to the Comic Cave. I'm Ramsey, aka Captain Away, and today I'm looking at the 2020 series Spider Man Noir Twilight in Babylon. Twilight in Babylon is Spider Man Noir's third solo series, though the first to not be done by his initial creative team of David Hine, Fabrice Sapolsky, and Carmine D. Gian de Monaco, which I probably mispronounced, so sorry. Instead, creative duties on this series would go to artist Juan Ferreira, who I've mentioned a few times previously on the channel for his exceptionally good artwork, and writer Margaret Stoll, who joins a growing number of novelists Marvel has been pulling in to write their comics. Stoll is perhaps best known for her young adult series Beautiful Creatures, which she co-wrote with Cami Garcia, who notably has been doing a lot of work for DC Comics, that traitor. Though this is his third solo title, it's not the Noir Spider's third adventure. That was actually a single issue adventure from the brief Edge of Spider-Verse series that was a build-up to the first Spider-Verse event, and saw Spider-Man Noir take on his own version of Mysterio. He would then go on to star in Spider-Verse itself, all three volumes that it's had, plus its direct sequel, spider get in which is pretty ridiculous. Just because something is successful doesn't mean you need to do it to death, Marvel. Maybe it was successful because it was unique, did you consider that? Anyway, his adventures in the Spider-Verses would eventually lead to his death, but don't worry, he got better. You really can't keep a good corpse down. He was brought back, apparently thanks to that same spider god thing that gave him his powers in the first place. And no doubt, he received a bit of a resurgence in popularity, thanks to the homage he received in Far From Home, and his incredibly enjoyable appearance in the Into the Spider-Verse movie. Which probably also didn't hurt his chances at resurrection. So returned to life, and with interest in the character again rising, Marvel considered it to be time for the hero to strike out on his own once again. So let's take a look at just how that went as we take this away. The comic opens on a dark and stormy day in a city that's just as dark and stormy in a private investigation of <coughs> Sorry, I I keep seeming to do that. Really, the comic opens on Peter Parker doing some serious noir-style man-brooding in the office for his private investigation company before shots fired send him out the window chasing after some bad guys. And we get a look at his sweet new outfit. It's very similar to his old outfit. Though he updated his mask, possibly in tribute to his new spider friends from other dimensions, added a little spider logo on his new belt buckle, and added a dapper little vest over his puffy turtleneck sweater. He's also carrying, and carelessly firing, the gun that he seemed to decide he shouldn't use anymore at the end of the first Spider-Man noir story. But I guess maybe his adventures through the multiverse have changed his mind on how good guns are. Despite the inconsistency, at least the art here is magnificent magnificently done by Juan Ferreira, who worked on part of the better of the two Suicide Squad series from DC's New 52 period, and also on the second volume of Gotham by Midnight, which I just recently covered. And notably, also did the art for the Spider-Verse issue that saw the rebirth of Spider-Man Noir, which this first issue directly references as having happened a month before this. Despite the fact that this series says it takes place in 1939, while that issue said it took place in 1933. With both dates contradicting a special video Marvel made about Spider-Man Noir that took place in 1940. And the end of that video directly led into spider Geddon, even though the events of that story are referenced as having happened in the past of this series. Confused yet? Once the bank robbers, whose attempted getaway or what captured Spidey's attention earlier, are all dealt with, Peter pulls off his mask and starts eating a hard-boiled egg. Because, you know, he's a hard-boiled noir detective, I guess. J. Jonah Jameson shows up, not for the robbers, but because he's on his way to Black Cat Speakeasy, where something bad happened. We're never told what that something was exactly, but it seems to have ended with three dead bodies. One of them being a waitress named Holly Babson, that Peter recognizes from the homeless outreach work his Aunt May and Mary Jane do. 
She's holding on to a necklace with a jeweled beetle. Only as Peter soon learns, it isn't a beetle, it's a cicada. A Babylonian cicada to be exact. And luckily for Peter, an exhibit on ancient Mesopotamia called Twilight in Babylon just happens to be in town. So Pete goes to speak with the head curator of the exhibit, but unfortunately he never arrived in town. So instead he speaks with the head Byzantinist? Um, what? That's someone who studies the history of the Eastern Roman Empire, which began, you know, around 300 AD, as in nearly 2,000 years after Babylonian history, or if we're being generous, nearly 600 years after the Neo-Babylonian history. Kind of the wrong part of history and very definitely the wrong political structures. And I thought they were struggling with what part of the 20th century this story takes place in. But anyway, this Eastern Roman Empire historian is Dr. Huma Bergman, and just happens to be the sister of Helga Bergman, whose lovely corpse we met earlier as Holly Babson, a name she went by to be more American. Huma tells us that the missing Twilight in Babylon curator, a Dr. Heinrich Hellstrom, was the last one to have the Babylonian cicada. So how it ended up with Holly Babson in New York after she was murdered is a bit of a mystery. One the surviving Bergman sister wants to get to the bottom of, though Pete initially declines her offer to travel across the world to dig up some answers. But his mind might soon be changed because it seems like someone is following him. Gasp! It's Carmen Sandiego! And soon, he, MJ, and Aunt May are all attacked at May's house by this mystery assailant, using the bright flash of a camera in an effort to blind them. I promise to stop picking on historical inaccuracies at every turn, but I don't think cameras like that were invented yet in 1939. Though, at least on this occasion, I think there actually might be an explanation, which... I'll get to later. Though he and MJ scare off the attackers, between the attack itself and MJ and May lecturing him on power and responsibility, Peter decides to join Dr. Bergman after all, so they travel by map to London, where it's revealed Peter's afraid of heights? What? He's a Spider-Man. This comic literally started with him jumping out of a skyscraper window. He says it's more that he's afraid of plunging towards depths like a pigeon trapped in an iron cage, which leads Huma to spend the rest of the series very annoyingly calling him Pidge. If you read this comic and completely missed the connection between those two lines and spent most of the comic wondering why the hell she insists on calling him Pidge, don't worry, you're not alone. I didn't figure it out until I deliberately tried to seek out the answer after having already read it all the way through once. In London, Pete and Huma go to a fancy party to meet up with some ambassadors that funded Huma in Heinrich's Babylonian dig where they found the cicada. And I have to say, it seems awfully suspicious to me just how much fun Huma seems to be having on this trip, despite her sister being dead and her archaeologist partner being missing. It's hard to tell at this point if that's just bad writing, bad characterization, or if it's really supposed to be suspicious. The ambassadors they meet are supposedly from Brazil, though Peter seems to have his doubts on that, but before we get to learn much about them, some thugs break in, steal the Babylonian cicada from Pete, and vanish into a phone booth like they're Doctor Who. Also, to chase after the thug, Peter just put his mask on in front of everybody. Is his identity a secret in this world or not? Because it seems like it's a secret from at least some people. Jonah seemed to be friendly with Pete, but he also still calls Spider-Man a menace, both at the beginning and end of the series. But I guess who has time for logic? Right now we have to rush Pete and Huma off to Sicily where they meet up with a pilot named Harry, who is apparently the daughter of the ambassadors and is the one who's going to fly them into Germany so they can look for the missing Dr. Hellstrom, despite those thugs still trying to stop them. Although, why? Were they not just after the gemstone? Why do they want these people dead? In Germany, they head to the Neus, Nez, Neus? Nuez? I don't know how to pronounce German things. Museum, where they find the good doctor dead on the floor of his office. Uh, I thought you said he was missing. You're telling me he's been missing for like two weeks now and nobody's bothered to check his office? Or maybe they did find this guy and just assumed he was Colonel Sanders. And that's not all they find here either. Enter Electro. 
This version of Electro has an almost steampunky power pack that he carries like he's a Ghostbuster, and it allows him to do the bright camera flashes to blind people like we saw earlier, so maybe that kinda explains that camera. I, I know, it wasn't an exciting reveal, but you know, get used to that. Spider-Man and Huma are saved by the appearance of Harry and a mysterious man, who it turns out is Tony Stark, world adventurer and international spy, who runs a speakeasy slash cabaret nearby, with an eyeglass shop as cover, though the cabaret itself is also cover for his spy ring. Layers and layers, brilliantly depicted in this amazing art from Ferreira. I love how it gives the sense of Stark as a frenetic, intense person without ever outright stating that. Even if this appearance completely contradicts the events of Scott Snyder and Manuel Garcia's Iron Man Noir, which took place in 1938, one year before this, but could only even theoretically work if it occurred after this. Ay ay ay, such a mess. Stark gets them back to their plane so they can move along, and despite Electro somehow magically showing up directly in their flight path through these mountains and trying to shoot them down, thanks to Spidey doing whatever a spider can, they manage to reach their destination. Istanbul, not Constantinople. It had by this point only just stopped being Constantinople. Why they changed it, I can't say. People just liked it better that way. Here in Istanbul, not Constantinople, they meet up with the noir version of Black Widow, her first appearance in the universe as far as I'm aware, though here they refer to her as Checkpoint Red. Get it? Cause she has red hair? Red takes them by camel to the dig site at Uruk, where the cicada was found in man. From Istanbul? That would be one hell of a camel ride. I mean, according to Google, it's nearly a 24 hour drive from Istanbul to Baghdad, and Uruk would be significantly further southeast from there. Unfortunately, camel is not a transportation option on Google Maps, so I'm not sure precisely how much longer that would take. But the dig site turns out to just be a Nazi trap, and what's worse, Dr. Bergman turns out to be a Nazi double agent. What? That German woman living in Germany in 1939 is a Nazi? Surely not. Thankfully though, she's not the only one with a secret, as it turns out Harry is actually Huri, a member of the Dora Milaje, meaning her and her parents were both Wakandan, not Brazilian, finally explaining that mystery as well. After fighting off the Nazis, Widow, Huri, and Pete all head inside the Temple of Inanna at the dig site. And just in case you're unaware, Inanna is one of the major deities of the ancient Sumerian pantheon. And while headed down there, they reveal to Peter what this all has actually been about this entire time. It seems that buried inside the Temple of Inanna is the legendary Makran Crystal. We're just hitting every part of the Marvel Universe here. I'm surprised Captain America and Namor don't show up at some point. I'm not sure if the Macron Crystal ever really had defined powers beyond just being something that's really powerful, but here it is basically referred to as the gateway between life and death. It also hulks up Electro and turns Spider-Man into an actual spider-like creature. Uh, nice line there, Widow, but you don't even seem to be making a fist, so I'm not sure it really works. The crystal also seems to open an actual gateway to the afterlife, as Huma is revealed to have yet another secret identity, because she is, in fact, the goddess Inanna. Yeah, sure, that makes sense. And with her powers unleashed and the doorway open, Inanna releases previous spider noir foes to deal with our heroes. And all the ones we saw die in earlier volumes are here. First there's Chameleon, and then the Goblin, Sandman from Volume 2, Vulture, although he looks a lot like the Goblin here to me, and lastly, Craven the Hunter. Hmm, you know, add Electro and you have six of them. Six men of the uh, Sinistry. No, wait, that may have been taken already. Well, I'm sure someone will come up with a good name for them. Peter uses bits of the Macron Crystal to try and fight off his six supervillain opponents while also trying to devise a way to stop Huma slash Inanna from claiming the Crystal's power for herself. Out of nowhere, she kind of warps into a scorpion person and Pete attempts to use her sting to break the crystal. But while the crystal does fracture, he takes the full blast himself and he falls down into a deep dark chasm. 
There he meets Anana's sister, Ereshkigal, in the form of first human sister, Holly Babson, then a giant spider, like, you know, the one that gave him his powers in the first place, then his kitty cat that he's apparently named Dingaling. So I imagine at this point, you're about as confused as I am as to what's going on. I'll try to explain. I guess basically we're saying that the ancient Sumerian gods, Inanna and Ereshkigal, are locked in some eternal battle for the power of the Makran Crystal. Holly slash Ereshkigal fears the destructive power of the crystal while Inanna craves it. The key to unlocking the crystal was the Cicada Stone, which Ereshkigal had been hiding from Inanna, most recently by disguising herself as a human woman in New York, thousands of miles from where the stone was recently dug up by Hellstrom, because you know, that makes sense. Who dug it up, no doubt unknowingly and unwittingly under the direction of Inanna disguised as Dr. Bergman. This kicked off a worldwide chase to get the stone and get it to the temple, which honestly doesn't explain any of the events we saw happen or why it seemed like the people who turned out to be working for Dr. Bergman were trying so hard to stop her from getting to this location. I guess you could say their main goal had really been to just stop Spider-Man so he wouldn't keep asking questions and he wouldn't get in the way, but I don't really know. Seems like once they got the stone from him, they could have just abandoned him and he would have been left with nothing, but okay. Ereshkigal gives Pete the stone and he takes it to the Macron crystal. When he shoves it into one of the fractures, it causes the crystal to explode, seeming to burn away Inanna, though our heroes walk out of the temple just fine. Aw oh yeah, look at that dramatic walk. The comic ends with Peter back in New York visiting the Met and its new exhibit, Sunrise in Babylon, that has a vase telling a strange new story. Kind of a Ghostbusters 2 ending there, but I guess I'm the last person who can complain about that, so I guess that just leaves us getting to the breakdown. My favorite thing about this series is Juan Ferreira's art. Though honestly I don't consider it the best looking comic he's done, I love the style he went with here. Like I said with the original Spider-Man noir comic, this is full color but the colors are very muted to help give it that noir feel. And Ferreira took that to such an extreme that most of the time this comic actually looks like it's black and white even when it's frequently not. And I love the theme of really emphasizing the red, which really pops whenever it's used, continuing to emphasize important details throughout the series, leading to, you know, the Macron crystal, which itself is basically red. Seriously, great job. I also think it's cool how Stoll decided to open this series with a classic noir style that inspired the original comic, but move into more of a classic adventure film of the kind that would inspire Indiana Jones. It's also nice to see the continued development of characters being brought into this universe, even if, like with Iron Man, it breaks some continuity with previous noir stories. And for just me personally, I'm sure very few others would feel this way, but I really liked the Babylonian tie-in because honestly, Sumerian history was my field of study in college, so, you know, that's cool to me. That's about all I like, though. The writing is fairly weak, and that becomes more and more obvious as the story degrades into a wild mess by the end of the series as the continuity and logic problems compound. The whole mystery is based on the stupid cicada thing that Holly Babson was just holding in her hand. Why didn't whoever it was that killed her just take it from her, preventing the whole plot from happening in the first place? Or if Electro was working for Huma, why didn't she just leave Peter once Electro got the rock from him? None of this story actually follows logically from one moment to the next once the mystery is unveiled. And I also find the choice of doing the Sinister Six weird, especially when it doesn't contain all original six members, with Doc Ock and Mysterio being replaced by Chameleon and the Goblin. But that's only because they actually could have all six members as the noir versions of all those characters, with the exception of Electro who was introduced here, already existed in the universe. But I can't really say that's a complaint, just something odd I kind of noticed. So overall, I'm giving this series a recommendation level of... Medium. It looks great, and it's nice to get a new Marvel Noir story, even if continuity issues run rampant and the whole thing kind of falls apart by the end. The Collected Edition gets one... Pidge. 
If you haven't figured it out by now, that's a bad thing. There's the five issues of the story itself, and a few alternate covers that appear between issues, and that's literally it. Not that I would expect a whole lot, but I still fear there could have been something more. Thanks everybody for watching! This should be the last of my trying to make up for Missing September, even though I'm sure you guys didn't really care that I missed Spider-Man month, but hey, I love doing Spider-Man stories, so... you know. So I guess as thanks for putting up with me, I guess next week I'll be doing something that you guys have requested, as in multiple of you have requested it, and on more than one occasion. So you probably don't want to miss that, so make sure you click that like button, the subscribe button, and probably that notification button, because I guess that's important as well. And then be sure to be here next time, and I hope to see you then, right here, in the Comic Cave.